Thank you. I'm going to tell you about digital holographic microscopy, which is a technique that I use as a graduate student in the Manaharan lab at Harvard. During this talk, I don't expect to convince all of you to use holographic microscopy because it's a fairly uh, specific technique. But I do hope that some of the approaches that I use towards putting an interactive visualization on top of it will extend to some of your projects. Microscopy has been around for hundreds of years and is a really valuable scientific technique. The reason for this, I think, is just one thing. Looking at stuff is intuitive. We're so used to looking at the world around us and interpreting it, making observations, and we can use that same experience and vocabulary to describe what we see in a microscope. Going back to the father of microscopy, he discovered bacteria in a sample when there was no concept of bacteria, but he could still look at that sample and describe what he saw, draw it, include the dotted line to show a little bit of motion. And also in the physical sciences, this figure really intrigues me because uh, Hook is showing the snowflake at various different levels of magnification and so using the same drawing technique to tell you about this sample that he's observing. Modern microscopy is only slightly different. We observe with uh, digital cameras and we observe much smaller things like this trans transmission electron microscope image of atoms in a hexagonal lattice, but still anybody could describe what they see in this image. They might not know it's atoms, but you have a common context to be able to describe it. So I'm not going to tell you right away what is happening here. This is a sample that I recorded in my lab, but I'd like you to think about how you would describe this. You might say that you see white dots and they're moving around, uh, but not in any one particular direction. Maybe you would say that they're blinking on and off or that they're apparent and then they disappear. If you'd sat down at a microscope for a little bit, you'd be able to figure out that when they disappear, really they're just moving in the axis perpendicular to the image going in and out of focus. And these are little plastic microspheres. And you're seeing them undergo Brownian motion. For my research, I care about where these particles are in 3D at uh, hundreds of frames per second. And I can't use this technique of bright field microscopy because they do go in and out of focus. So instead I use this technique, digital holographic microscopy. And the main difference here is that instead of white light illumination, we just illuminate it with a laser. And you can see a hologram here of one sphere moving around just like the spheres that were moving around before. But instead of going out of focus, you see that the ring pattern changes. And the camera detects the interference of the light that was scattered off of the spheres with the light that just passes by unperturbed. You can get perhaps some intuition for this if you did a single slit diffraction experiment in a physics class where the pattern of bright stripes on the wall tells you about the size of the slit and how far away it is. You can think of the hologram as a two-dimensional representation of that that depends on the x, y, z coordinates of the particle as well as its radius and the uh, material that it's made out of. So digital holographic microscopy records with simple cameras, research grade cameras, uh, 2D images, but encodes 3D information. And we need to do post-processing to get all the information back out of it. And there are two main ways to do that. One of them is called reconstruction. And in that, we use what we know about the physics of how light propagates through media to take the hologram that you see on the bottom of the, the two cubes on the left and figure out where the light must have diverged from to create those images. This gives you a general sense of where the object was, but you can see that the purple objects that should be spheres are actually a little bit elongated along the axis of the propagation of light. And you can't see objects that are hidden by another object. The light only goes back as far as uh, one place that it came from. Our other technique is fitting to a complete scattering model. And in this technique, we calculate the forward scattering off of these spheres, which we use a Mie scattering theory named after Gustav Mie, uh, or a multi-sphere technique that includes the scattering from one sphere to another and then to the detector. And so here's a data, uh, a video of data and a best fit, and then the a rendering of the positions of the three spheres in that best fit uh, over time. 
Oh, and uh, both those methods are implemented in HollowPy, the software maintained in the Manaharan lab with the lead developer, Tom, sitting here in the front row. And I built my visualization on top of the HollowPy package. So I use mostly the fitting technique, and the theories for these light scattering computations involve crazy functions that I'd never heard of before getting into this, like spherical Henkel functions and Riccati Bessel functions. And I can't intuitively understand those as they're written on the page, and I can't describe to you how the hologram changes when I change one of those parameters just by looking at the equations. So we're lucky here that we can turn them into an intuitive medium, uh, because the equations describe images. So my dream was to be able to have an interactive way to change the parameters around and live time updates see how the hologram calculation changes. An impediment to this was that it takes one second to calculate an image, even just 256 by 256 pixels. And so I decided to parallelize this. I used PyCuda. And on a research grade GPU, you can speed it up 125 times. This is because the slowest part is evaluating these functions at every single pixel, and it's completely pixel-wise parallelizable. But I wanted to be able to interact with this on my own computer, wherever I might go, and on uh, the GPU on this laptop, it takes 50 mi milliseconds, uh, and that's still fast enough to be able to have some kind of interactive in interactivity. So with 20 frames per second, I was able to go ahead and build an interface in PyQt, and I show the, dis the calculated hologram, the XYZ coordinates, which are akin to the knobs that I'm used to turning on a microscope. That's how I usually interact with my science. The radius and index of refraction, which is how you characterize the material. The different theories that I want to be able to compare to one another and parameters about the microscope, like the wavelength of light that you're using, as well as the syntax for how Holopy describes an object with all of these parameters so that you can go back to Holopy and write some scripts. So this is how it works. Uh, you drag around the different parameters, and you can see here a new learner might learn that we have a little bit of a quirky definition of where x and y axes are, but you can quickly pick that up if you slide those around. You can also learn how the hologram changes when you move the particle farther away. You see that the rings get bigger, which is in contradiction to how we usually see things in perspective in our macroscopic world, this is uh, because you can think of a flashlight with the beam expanding before it hits the detector. So there's this cone of light that expands. So you need to get used to that as a new holographer. Here's something that I didn't know until I played around it with, played around with it in the GUI. I'm changing the index of the material here. And it's important to think about the index of the material relative to the medium that it's in. Here I have the medium set to 1.33, and as I bring the medium of the particle down through 1.33, you see that it flips. There's this uh, switch in intensity that I didn't know to expect there, and never would have thought to investigate that with the theory, and so that kind of suggests to me some interesting experiments. Right now we work with particles that just have a fixed index all the time, but it could be fun to look at a material that's very close to the index of the background and varying. I also like to be able to test the different theories against each other, so I'm showing here the numerical reconstruction. I calculate a hologram and then I reconstruct from that distance. And we'd always anticipated that the reconstruction would be a good estimate of what the hologram looks like at a different distance. But switching back and forth between the reconstruction, you can see how much edge, edge effects you get coming in. And that really only maybe the center ring is well approximated by these intermediate reconstructed holograms. And then things get much more interesting when you add in another particle. Initially, the particles are far apart, and you can see the two different ring patterns, so you could point to them and say that's where the x and y coordinates are. But as you pull them together, they actually merge into one uh, ring pattern with this additional linear fringe pattern cutting across it, which tells you about the relative orientation of the two spheres. 
And lastly, we have two different theories for two particle holograms or multi particle holograms. One of them is the, just the superposition of the two separate spheres, and the other one includes the coupling between the two spheres, which is a very slow calculation that I haven't uh, parallelized yet. It took eight seconds to calculate that, but now that it's calculated, I have it cached so that you can switch back and forth. And in the lower right corner, you can see that the gray lines are a little bit different between these two theories, so you can get an intuition for in what ways the theories vary. Uh, so in conclusion, I like to tell you that I learned that when theories describe images, you should just go ahead and look at the images. It'll be a lot more intuitive. And that uh, exploring theory interact interactively is a natural environment for insights, especially if you can make that environment in a similar way to how an experimentalist interacts with their equipment. And you're welcome to look at this project on GitHub. And I'd like to thank uh, Chris Cheka and the Holopi team in the Manaharan Lab. And I'd be happy to do a live demo for anyone who wants to catch me after the talk.